our own nice to see you all for those of you who have been trying to take pictures to get pictures of Davis <laughs> you should know that Ajahn Brahm what does Brahm mean? Brahm is from Brahma, one of the Davis <laughs> so take a picture of me, you've got a Davis straight away <laughs> Venerable, welcome Okay, so this evening's Dhamma talk, we're going to be talking about uh, the end of the journey, enlightenment. Still a few people haven't finished their journey into the hall yet, so we better wait for a few moments. And this is the last Dhamma talk uh, this session. Uh, maybe I should mention that uh, the people from uh, the BGF, the Buddhist Gem Fellowship, which have been inviting me before and have agreed to have a couple of talks uh, in the end of January. That's next month. So there's some more talks coming. So don't worry if you're not enlightened yet. <laughs> You've got many more chances. And it gives me a month to think of some new stories and new jokes for you. <laughs> okay, so today's Dhamma talk is on uh, the end of the journey, enlightenment. And of course, for all of those of you who've been on this Dharma retreat, uh, it is a journey and you're coming close to the end of the journey yet, but hopefully it really is the end of a journey and not just the start of another one. Because sometimes it's, uh, when we look at our life, when we get one thing finished, another thing starts, and life seems endless. But the Buddha said, yes, it is an end of this life, there is an end of the universe, but that's to be found in this fathom-long body with its mind. In other words, when one practices meditation, one can come to the end of things. And like any journey, if it didn't have an end to it, the journey would be hopeless. So there is an end to your journey, and that's called Nibbana, enlightenment. But sometimes as practitioners, we need to actually understand what, exactly what that word means. I mentioned yesterday sort of my own spiritual journeys in the sense that when I was young, I was supposed to be a Christian, but I asked people what God meant, and I could never get a straight idea, a straight answer what God meant. And it's the same thing with enlightenment. I could never get a straight answer what enlightenment meant. You go in to ask even monks, and they say, he who says doesn't know. <laughs> he who knows doesn't say. And I thought, what a great line. <laughs> Until I figured out, if he said that, Whoever says doesn't know. If he said that, he obviously didn't know. <laughs> so the point is, it's easy to be clever about these things. But I really wanted to find out someone who knew what they were talking about. And it's always been an understanding which I've had. If a person can't explain it clearly, most of the time they don't know what they're talking about. They're just making it up. Or they're just trying to grab onto some uh, little concept, strange idea, which because it's mystical, in other words, because no one can understand it, some people think, oh, it must be the truth. Because too often there is that sort of mysticism, that mysteriousism, when people actually say these amazing things, say, wow, that's really good, because you don't understand it. But remember that if you can't understand it, the chances are neither can the person who's just told you that. <laughs> And there was something which I read a long time ago when I was a student. I forget the actual philosopher, but the philosopher said that if there's any truth, if a child can't understand it, it's not real truth. So I wanted actually to find out an understanding of enlightenment. First of all, if we're going to talk about enlightenment, what actually enlightenment is. So you can understand exactly what you're doing. And you can also check out other people to see if they understand what they're doing. In all the years which I've been teaching and listening to stories, the story which best encompasses what enlightenment is, in a way which ordinary people can understand, even children can understand, is a story about the ending of desire. I think many of you would have probably heard from the monks, read from the text, that what enlightenment is, the ending of greed, hatred and delusion. What does that actually mean in practice? And how could a child understand that? Remember, this is the end of the journey. Because sometimes when I talk about contentment, letting go, end of desire, 
people in the world are saying, I've got a job to do. I've got people working for me. I can't give up desire yet. And yet what you're saying is correct. This is the end of the journey, not the middle. This is actually where you're going to end up at, not where you are now. So understanding that, please don't get afraid. I'm not going to ask you to all become monks and nuns after this talk. Carry on working. Be good. Keep your precepts. Be as peaceful and as compassionate and hardworking as you possibly can. But as you practice the Dharma, I'm going to tell you where it leads. Eventually there will come the time when you, you retire, you leave the world, either early on in life or later on in life. And you can't be working all your life. You do your job, you do your duties as best you can. There'll come a time when you give up your job, your children are uh, grown up, and you want to spend more time sort of developing your mind and going closer to the Buddha's teaching of enlightenment. Because you know the Buddha left the world and the great monks and nuns who became enlightened lived a very peaceful life. And maybe if you can't even become a monk, at least the end years of your life, if you have good health, you can actually leave your job, retire and practice Dhamma. <coughs> so this is for those people at the end of their life, what actually Nibbana is. And the story is one of my favorite ones, but it's incredibly profound. I'll just tell you the ordinary story first and then you can contemplate it or I can explain it afterwards. It's the story of the wishing game, the five children playing the wishing game. I haven't told this in the, the book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, because it's going to be in another book which I'm writing, or which I've written, it's just being edited now in the US. But the story of the wishing game is the best story which really gets to the heart of what enlightenment is in a practical way which you can really understand. The story of the wishing game goes like this. There were five children playing a wishing game. The rules of the game is you have a wish and whichever child gets the best wish wins the wishing game. So the first child was asked, if you had a wish, what would it be? And being only a child, he said, if I had a wish, I'd wish for a McDonald's hamburger with double fries <laughs> because he liked McDonald's hamburgers. Very good, the other children said. Now they asked child number two, if you had a wish, what would it be? Perhaps because he had more chance to think. He said, if I had a wish, I'd wish for a McDonald's hamburger restaurant because with a restaurant I can get many hamburgers not just one. And if I owned the restaurant, my mother could never stop me getting one. And of course, a child who only got one hamburger thought, I've lost. That guy is smarter than me. And they asked the third child, if you had a wish, what would your wish be? Straight away, the child said, if I had a wish, I'd wish for one billion dollars. US, of course. Because with one billion dollars US, I can buy my own McDonald's restaurant. I can have as many hamburgers as he has. But I will also buy my own video game store. So I can play video games. Then I'll buy my own school. If I buy my own school, I won't have to go and still get the best grades. <laughs> I might even be able to buy my own university later on and award myself a degree. <laughs> And I'd still have many millions of dollars left to get whatever I want whenever I think about it. Because it takes a lot to spend one billion dollars US in one lifetime. And so the guy who only got one hamburger restaurant thought, oh, how stupid I am. If only I would have thought of that. That guy with the one billion dollar wish is sure to win the wishing game. But there's two more children left yet. If you haven't heard this before, what would your wish be? The fourth child said, if I had a wish, I'd wish for three wishes. That's a wish, he said. Fair enough. It doesn't break the, the rules. With my first wish, I'll have a hamburger restaurant, McDonald's. With my second wish, I'll have the one billion dollars US. And for my third wish, I'll have three more wishes. 
So that way I can go on forever, be that. And the first three children thought this poor child was a genius. He's sure to win the wishing game. It was an infinity of wishes. What people in the world would dream about. Whatever you want, you will get whenever you want it. Surely that's the ultimate happiness. Surely that must win the wishing game. But there was one child left. The next child formulated a wish which would win the wishing game. He said, if I had a wish, I wish I was so content I never needed any more wishes again. I wish I was so content I never needed any more wishes again. That child wins the wishing game. That child is the Buddha. Do you understand that story? When you think about it, having as many wishes given to you, it always means if you have another wish, you're not really happy. You always want something more. However, in a wishing game, the last child understood. I'm so content, I don't need any more wishes. That is superior. We call that the freedom from desires. The fourth child, who had an infinity of wishes, his idea of happiness is called the freedom of desires. Now you see, in our world, most of our aim, most of our striving, is to actually get a freedom of desires. So that whenever we want something, we can always get it. To have enough money, to have enough power. To have enough means, if we want to go to New York, Perth, wherever, we can always go there. If we want to buy a house, buy a car, buy some clothes, if we want to give some money to our kids, whatever it is, we have what we want. In other words, we're striving for a freedom of desires. And if you look in modern Western countries, their constitutions, their whole ethos is to try and give their citizens just that, to give them the maximum freedom to realize their desires. And that is why in Western countries, like the US, they have this idea of freedom. But what that freedom is, is just the freedom of desires. To get whatever you want, whenever you want it, for some people. The American dream. But the American dream is not the Buddhist dream. Which is why if any of you have ever been to that country, or been in the West, you find that many people, especially rich people, never feel free even though they have huge amounts of money, even though they have great abilities to come and go in their private jets to have whatever they want, they never feel free. Why? Because they do have the freedom of desires, but they don't know the freedom from desires. There's another little story which emphasizes this. Again, a story from my life. I think I told this in Singapore, not here, but if I have told it here, please interrupt me. Sometimes being a monk, you give so many talks, so many questions, I don't know what I've said or what I haven't said, so please forgive me. <laughs> it was a story when I was a young monk, I'd helped someone because they needed some help and I'd served them and then they came up afterwards, they say they wanted to give me some money. I said, I'm a monk who doesn't receive any money. But they were smart. There is actually a way around this. What you can do is actually you can say, Ajahn Brahm, you really helped me. I want to get something for you personal. Not for your monastery, not for your retreat centre. For you. What can I get you, he said, for 100 baht. It was in Thailand. So he actually named the amount, so I knew exactly just what he was talking about. And he said, let me know, what can I get you for 100 baht? You can actually do that. You can come up to me and say, Ajahn Brahm, for 50 ringgit, what can I get for you? Anything personal, anything you need. But please don't do that to me. It was done to me so many years ago. He came up and said, you've really helped me, I've got 100 baht for you, what can I get for you? Because they can't give you the money, but they can give you the goods. I was so happy before he said that. I was so at peace, I was a very happy little monk. 
But as soon as he said that, I started thinking, what do I want? And I couldn't actually think of it at the time. And he was in a rush. So we came to agreement. He said, look, I'm coming back tomorrow. If you can't think about it now, just go back to your hut, think about it there, write it down, and I'll come in the morning. So I went back to my hut, I got out a piece of paper, what do I want for a hundred baht? And I started thinking. And I wrote something down, and I wrote something else down. In five minutes, hundred baht was not enough. <laughs> when I looked at all those things, yeah, I just couldn't bring myself to cross anything out. And more than that, every time I started thinking, I started adding more things on. In about ten minutes, one thousand baht was not enough. If I'd have carried on, one million baht would not be enough. And as soon as I wrote those things down, every one of those things was really important to me. And I saw what was going on. My sort of so-called wants had turned to craving and turned to real grasping. And I screwed that piece of paper up, I threw it in the bin. And next morning when he came, I said, don't give me anything, put that hundred baht in the donation box for the monastery and don't do that to me ever again. <laughs> he just showed me just what craving is and what desire is. What is the difference between needs and wants is a very fine line. And actually most of the time, because of delusion, all of our needs becomes wants. And we never have enough. One of the reasons I became a monk was because when I was very young, I started to look at life and see what I was doing. Sometimes it was crazy what I was doing, what other people were doing in their life. It was like this, that when I was very young, I used to love playing soccer with my friends in the park, which is you know, just on the opposite side of the road to where my parents lived. However, when I got to about 14, my parents and my teachers took me aside and said, listen, Stop wasting your time chasing a football. Stay at home. Do your homework. Study more. Because you're doing your O-levels this year. I did my O-levels a bit earlier. Because if you do, you know the O-level examinations. You, know, you have them here in Malaysia as well. Because if you pass your O-levels and do well, they told me, then you'll be happy. And I believe them. So I stopped go going with my friends to the park and I instead stayed at home, studied and I did very well at my O-levels. However, the promised happiness never came. Because I did well at my O-levels, I had to stay on at school doing A-levels now. <laughs> but, they said, about this time my father died, my mother and my teachers, the rest of my family said, look, you've done well, keep on studying. At that time, I wasn't chasing footballs, I was chasing girls. <laughs> they say, stay at home. Do your studies, because if you pass your A-levels, then you'll be happy. <laughs> so I did that, and I did very well at my A-levels. So I had to go to Cambridge. More exams, more studies. So I still wasn't happy. But, they said, now, at university, if you pass your exams at university, if you study hard, don't go to the parties, don't stay in the bar, stay in your room, study, work hard, pass your exams, because if you get your degree, then you'll be happy. <laughs> and of course, by this time, this was a time, as I wrote in the little book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, this was a time I started to get suspicious. <laughs> Because I started looking at my friends, the people who'd finished university. Were they happy once they got their degree? All of those of you who've gone to university, are you happy when you finished and got your degree? You've got to go to work now. <laughs> and that's really hard. And when you go to work, people say, well, what are you going to work for? To save up, to get enough money, and then you'll be happy. And I saw some of my friends, they were saving up for their first car. And they were telling me, they were getting these magazines, looking at the car they were going to buy, saying, oh, I need another few hundred dollars, because when I buy my car, <laughs> then I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah? Because what happened next, they were all going out with, you know, the girls were going out with boys, the boys going out with girls. And the boys, they will say that when I meet my, my soulmate, 
the person who's meant for me in heaven. When I meet them, I know 